example, I don't think we have anyone signed up for exercises today. So, and there was one exercise, which if I could find the book, I would talk about, but there's something I want to work through, but I got really busy with work, but I think it was, uh, guys, you didn't find it? Uh, yeah, I, you can't find the book, which... Um, it's, uh, you know, which one it is, uh, um, August, it was on, can you go to the exercises and turn it to the, the last part of that exercise, like the second half, not the, the like if you flip it over and the last page of that mm -hmm. exercise, like there's one, one pro problem in particular, I, I wanted to uh, work through myself before mm -hmm. today, but I just literally did not have time to even take a breather. Do you, do you want to hold it up? Yeah, I'll tell you which one it was. Uh, it was um, the following is a, yeah, it was four. I wanted to do four point six because I think four point six is a really great way to um, tie what we've learned together. So I don't have my book with me here. For the life of me, I cannot locate that textbook. But if um, I thought maybe a great way is to finish off the latter half of the presentation and. And like maybe talk through that if we could, because it's 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 a pretty tough uh, one, but it, I think it basically gets into whatever we learned so far. So let me just go ahead and present now. Um, I did uh, use Solomon's uh, presentation for the. I mean, I I knitted his uh, RMD for this because I really could not put anything together. So apologies for that. So if I'm not mistaken, we stopped at, um, let's see where we stopped at. I believe that we, um, did we go through bias and estimation? Um, not sure I understood that, but we can talk through that. Not sure if we actually did talk about that last time. Do you guys remember? Um, I, I, I think, think I was, so. sorry, go ahead. I don't think so. I think we just got to variance. Yeah, so I feel like we got to the part where we looked at the uh, the difference in standard errors between two groups, and then they we figured out the formula for computing that. So I I kind of got at that point, and I feel I think I feel pretty confident about that so far. Uh, so let's get into bias and unmodel certainty. I read read through this, and I have to say I'm a little bit uh, I'm like I got it, but I feel like it's not really like sunk in. So. We say that an estimate is unbiased if it is correct on an average. For a simple example, consider a survey, a simple random sample of adults in which, oh, where was it? Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you so much. Okay, I had all my notes because I was trying to work through that. It had fallen out. Thank you, guys. So my two little helpers uh, actually helped me find it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I appear to have dropped all my statistics books and on the other side of the table. Thank you so much. I was actually trying to work through this on, I think, uh, Saturday or Sunday, but thank you, thank you very much. Um, yes, and that's correct. 4.6 was what I was really wanting to do. Okay, thank you guys, I appreciate it. Um, so if it is correct on average, assuming responses are complete and accurate, the average response in the sample is an unbiased estimate of the average number of hours walked by or watched in the population. So, uh, okay, so let's just talk through this together. I believe that it's a Poisson distribution because of, um, uh, isn't Poisson used when you have like a weird kind of a distribution and it's not like a normal distribution? Yes, so or I count data. Ah, for count data. Okay, so maybe that's why, since here they're counting the the unit measure. Okay, so that makes sense. And I'm not sure what lambda is, but um, I think that's probably part of the Poisson formula. Um, and so they set seed, call the function, and then thousand samples for which n is equal to hundred. So in other words, they're doing a random. Uh, they're doing like a, like a doing 100 samples, but they're repeating it a thousand times. So kind of like bootstrapping, right? So I want to also bring up one thing which I posted in the other uh, book club, which is a picture I saw of what bootstrapping is. So just tell me if you guys understand this and um, one second. Uh, 
second. Um, I'm trying to see where that was. Sorry. Um, where is that? So the figure kind of looks like this. Can you guys see this, uh, this image? Mm, no. Okay, I'm gonna reshare that. So this is the share, this is the basic bootstrap theory. If this is your original sample, and this is your sample that's replicated a huge number of times, um, you basically get a, a lot of samples. So this is, this is not called replication apparently, but it's called replacement. It's called sampling with replacement. So can you tell me if anyone, can you make sense of that? Because it's not directly connected to what we're talking about, but when you have a sample of 100 and you do that a thousand times, what does that mean? Because that is yeah, yeah. strapping. Yeah. Sorry, Mikhail, do you wanna go? Um, yes, yeah, so I think replacement can be a bit misleading. So sampling with replacement is that, so you have the whole uh, population of observation. And then in, when you're bootstrapping, then you're taking a subset of those observations and then you put them back. So replacement is, means putting them back. It's not like um, taking them out and put them at another place. And then after you put them back, then you sample again. So it means that um, over the repeated number of sampling or repeated number of bootstraps, one sample can be selected multiple times. But what does this mean exactly? Like, if if you're putting it back, like why why do the number of is is it just means that you take seven three seven two 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 six one so many times and you put it back that you just? I I think the diagram's not very good to be honest. Um, yeah, it's because it shows the sample but not the population it draws from. Um, I've got I've yeah. got a better example for you. Um, Let me stop sharing then. Um, if I just share quickly. Yeah, bit. I just stop sharing. Yeah. Um, can you like so if you look at this here, um, so you can so you're collecting samples, so you're pulling out samples from your. Oh, that's maybe not so good actually. Let's mm -hmm. zoom. Uh, this is better. So, uh, you, oh God, that's not good either. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, oh yeah, this is a this is a good example. So you pull out your pop so you've got a population and mm -hmm. then you pour a sample out of it and then you pour another sample out of it or another sample and you do it each time. So if I've got a population of say a thousand people uh, uh, working mm -hmm. this to want to measure and mm -hmm. I don't can't get them all, but what I can do is I can measure five hundred people, uh, which gives us a bit of error. Um, but what we can do in order to mitigate the populate the distribution curve and to make our um, our samples better because if you remember about the central limit theorem how yes. if you're resampling something eventually that distribution curve then yeah. the Gaussian curve. Yeah. Well if you resample your data you can do that. So you create lots of different samples of your data to create different distributions and mm -hmm. then the distributions you use in order to aggregate to make the better sample overall. So what, what that means is, if you collect, say, out of the thousand you, you possibly get, you only get 500, then mm -hmm. you can then say, well, I'll sample 100 people out of each, out of 500, and then I'll do that, then I'll put all those people back into that, and then I'll sample that data out again, and then I'll sample it out again, and different iterations. And then you end up with, say, a sample, a sampling, a sample like this, I suppose. Uh, just trying to make it I'm just trying to make it as visual as possible um they start off with a sample but actually you always start off with a population so um so you've got a population like this and then what you'll do is you'll pull out say a certain amount of data from your from your population and then that creates your distribution for that lot or in the case of what it did up here is what it's saying is you can pull out the estimation or the parameters and then you do that multiple times and that just gives you a better, stronger, um, a, a stronger distribution, I suppose. 
that makes sense. <laughs> so when you replace it, is it between each sampling it's replaced or is it replaced like at the end of your overall analysis? Like when, when does the replacement actually take place? So each time, so each time, so um, if you think of it like say, um, so those 500 people are 500 lines in a, uh, in a data frame. Then what 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 would bootstrapping sound? What bootstrapping one hundred will do is pull out a hundred lines, and then it will then say, well, this is sample number one, and then it will then put then it will then resample from the whole lot again. So replace replacement means everything goes back in. Whereas what you can do is you can uh, resample with um, you can resample with non replacement. So that means that each sample, say, uh, say you might take 10% each time you sample. So, but at random. So, say you take the first 100 people, and then you're left with 400, uh, 400 line uh, rows, and then you take the next 100, and then you take the next 100, and eventually you got 500. Sorry, five samples of 100, and that, that would be without replace replacement. See what I mean? So, but then when, when you replace something, does it mean you estimate the sample, uh, uh, your sa summary statistic or your point estimate and then put it back and then do the next one? Or do they happen in parallel? Because then in that case, how was it replacement? Um, so you're, so, so I think you can imagine you have, let's say five candies in a um, pot. And so, uh, when you're bootstrapping, you want to simulate many, many uh, samples with the same size. So you want to, so from these five candies, you want to have um, many copies of candies with an N of five. So you take uh, one candy out of the pot and then you, well, you note that, uh, you note what candy that you took and then you put it back and then you draw another candy and then repeat until you have uh, five of it. And then that concludes one um, bootstrap sample. So I get it. So that's what you're doing. You're taking it out and you're replacing it. Yeah. Correct? So that's what that book said. But I, like intuitively, I don't understand what that means. So for example, the exact words, and this is exactly what they said, which basically is what you have said is that you can, you create, okay, here's what it is. Draw a sample value, record it, replace it. Do that N times. Record the mean of the N sample value. So you take, let's say you have 10 values, okay? And you wanna take out samples of three. And at first I take out a value one. I record one, put it back. The next time I get back, let's say five record it, put it back. And then let's say I get five again because it's put back. So the replacement is happening between the sampling, like for each value. It's not happening when you take out one whole set and then you replace it. So that's the part which is not intuitive to me that as you take each sample, even if your sample size is say 500, you take one, record it, put it back, take two, all the way up to 500. So you've repeated that n times. And so then you have a mean of your 500 values. And let's say you're doing that a thousand times. But for that 500 values that you get, you take one, put it back, take one, put it back. So that part, I thought the replacement happens after you have the whole 500 you put them back and then you do that a thousand times, but actually you're doing, you're doing the replacement 500 times, 1000 times, right? Because that's, that's exactly how many times it's being replaced. I was under the impression that replacement, you can do it like that, but I was under the impression that it works better. This is a problem where it comes in when you start thinking about using it as programming. Um, it works better to do, to uh, take one out. So this is an example from tidy models. Um, so this is, so over here is your population that you've collected data from. And then what you do is you just pull out your uh, different folds of data. Um, so 
it, so what what that's showing is you pull it out at the end. There's no replacement until you take your next. Um, there's no replacement until you take your next bootstrap. So each time you do, a, each time you collect a sample from the data, um, uh, the data is just selected. So if you've pulled out, like say two, four, seven, and eleven, and all these yellow numbers, then these numbers are left behind, right? Actually, uh, sorry, what this shows here is so if you look at this grid at the top, we've got three colors, yeah. And when we've, pulled, when we've pulled out our first lot of data, we've just pulled out 1, 3, 14, et cetera, these, these green colors. The next time we do it, we start again with this grid and we pull out, say, these, these or we, we pull out this and then we pull out that. Uh, this isn't quite actually how it works, um, but uh, because this is showing a, a test set versus a, a validation, so, uh, test set versus a... Um, yeah, I have seen this one before. You're right. It's actually showing you uh, across the validation, how the validation is working in a tenfold thing. But, and but, it's kind of similar even there. Like you're, you're kind of on the right track because that's yeah. also with replacement. So I think it leads, one leads to the other, but I'm already so muddled about just the concept of uh, sampling and resampling that like this is just like a step ahead. There are just different ways to do it. Um, you don't have to... Um, you don't have to put like take like one marble out the jar and then put it back in. It's more like you take a hundred marbles out of the jar, measure those, and then you put them back in, and then you do then you roll up the you shake up the jar again, and then you pull the, pull out the marbles again. Mm -hmm. That's the way. That's the way how I think of it anyway. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I thought, and that but okay, so maybe there are different ways to do it. So Mikhail, would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. Cool, okay, well, let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay, all right, so, um, and so this is, you have 1000 samples where N is equal to 100 and Lambda is two. And uh, what he has here is that he has his, um, so the sample distribution of means over those 1000 thousand, uh, times sampling of um, N equal to 100. He, the sample means are unbiased estimates of the mean for Poisson Lambda equal to um, and so this is what apparently they get, which looks, um, I mean, if you smooth this out, it's definitely a normal distribution. Uh, so do you guys agree with that? Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty um, self-explanatory. So. Oh, yeah, so, sorry, so that's the point that the whole um, sam the sampling is meant to do. It's more likely to create that distribution. So when you count the, re when you do the resampling, it, it causes um, it causes that to happen. That's, that's why we want to Okay, gotcha, okay. All right, so supposing, now suppose we have women who are more likely to answer the survey with non-response depending only on the gender, the sample will on average overrepresent women and women on average watch less television than men. So the number of hours watched in the sample is now a biased estimate of the proportion of the population. So that's why you weighted based on um, the, um, I guess you normalize it in a sense. So, and that's what they have done here. So if you can work this out with the mini simulation, sticking with the overall population mean of two hours, let's presume that women watch one and a half uh, hours of television and men watch two and a half hours. So then you have a 50, 50%, uh, then we can, um, Okay, then you can estimate the space run if you have a 60% uh, of uh, women. Okay, I think that makes sense, right? Like, so they have actually weighted it in uh, the percentage of women there. So I think, um, so now when you group this, SF, you can see that. Uh, okay, so when divided by that, it's indeed biased. Or, but now if you actually weight it, then you get this. So because women on average watch lesser, your mean was also like a lower value, but then when you actually have your, um, your, your normalization relative to the population, then you get a much higher value. So um, yeah, I think, uh, does that make sense? And does anyone have any questions there? Okay. 
So one concern when performing data analysis is the possibility of mistakenly coming to strong conclusions that do not replicate or reflect real life patterns. And I think being in science, I think we guys can definitely attest to that, that something might make statistical significance, but it's not like scientific, uh, it's not scientifically significant. So like that's what they get into a little bit later where they talk about statistical versus scientific significance. And um, so then, of course, you have the whole jargon of a null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis where, um, you know, um, you've got to be really careful about how you word your, uh, how you how you say something is uh, either, um, uh, either you reject the null hypothesis or that you support the null, um, yeah, either you reject the null hypothesis or you support the null hypothesis, but I don't think you ever say that you support the alternative hypothesis because that's not what you're saying. The the app the, when when you reject the null hypothesis, all that you're saying is that this is too simplistic, or we don't have enough here. We either going to have to collect more data, or we need to have like a better model for us to get to that point where we actually reject the null hypothesis. So I think um, that's kind of what they get into here. Where um, so you have this treatment group, and then you have the control group, and the treatment is uh, lowering cholesterol, and so your uh, theta hat, uh, which is your uh, what your estimate is, is going to be the difference between these two, uh, and then um, theta hat. And the standard error, of course, as we've seen before, is that sum of uh, standard error. Uh, what is that? Square plus uh, yeah, standard error two square. So if you have two groups here, that would be square. And then your, um, and since this is a T distribution, this would be the 95th percentile. And that's your number of uh, degrees of freedom. So the oh, null and- um, <laughs> Wow, well, well, quite quick, sorry. Um, so what is this? Uh, theta T is, um, is comparison group one and then theta C is comparison group C. Yes, yeah, so this, correct. So this is your treatment group. And this is your um, the control group, and I guess theta is your parameter that you are estimating, which I think should be like uh, effect seen or effect not seen. Like what I'm not sure what that parameter is, but there is some difference that this parameter is measuring. And uh, I think we already saw before that when you have two groups, the standard error is um, of the difference is going to be the sum of the two standard errors uh, uh, with a and a square root, like a square root of the sum of the two standard errors. The uh, 95 confidence interval is quite complicated looking. Yes, so I got confused here. Then I realized that they were doing it as a T distribution. And mm -hmm. so, um, and the 0 0.975 actually is um, exactly like corresponding to the 95th uh, interval. So when you have 0.975 uh, or the 97.5th percentile, it actually corresponds. I, you know, I'm sure there is some table or some. Oh, they're doing a two. Oh, no, it's the two one times one standard five. error. Yeah. Two times of the standard error is, I mean, of that. Yeah, for uh, 95% confidence the tail, interval. The tail. Oh, right. I, I, I thought the reason, so I, I, I'm, I'm assuming here, if you've got approximate 95% interval, and if they're looking for the difference between things, then what they're working here with is a um, one tailed hypothesis. Um, so, uh, just give me one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so the test statistic is summarizing the deviation of the data from what would be the expected value under the null hypothesis. So that is your absolute value of the T-score. Uh, and this is of course a two-sided T-test because either of that, uh, either positive or negative uh, deviations could be noteworthy. Uh, any any confusion there? Like this, this part I was relatively um, 
clear about. So I guess the null hypothesis is that, that there's no difference between the treatment and control. And in a hypothesis test, the deviation of the data from the null hypothesis is summarized by the p-value, the probability of observing something at least as extreme as the observed test statistic. So if since it's a t-distribution, it comes, you have the, the, the degrees of freedom here. And oh, this is a little bit uh, heavy, so. Um, yeah, that I did not even attempt to, but I think it's just your standard uh, formula. Okay, so here to perform a hypothesis test, we must define a test statistic, which is a function of the data. And for a given data y, the p-value is the probability of that statistic with your replication data being greater than or equal to your uh, test statistic of y, which I guess is the one without the replication. Uh, not sure what that means. The probability of this happening needs to be greater than or equal to uh, the probability of this, uh, but not sure what the difference between the rep versus the non-rep is, frankly. It's a little bit confused. Does anyone know the difference between these two? Rep versus non-rep. Hmm. It just says potential replication data, but I'm not entirely sure what that means. What that really means. Yeah, um, like it would make more sense if one was like the the test and the other one was the control, but no, they made it like rep versus like just the one without. So I'm, I guess the right uh, so the right hand side is for the actual data, right? And the left one is from the model. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, no, that sounds about right. So um, because you're you're using the um, distribution, aren't you, to work out what you would expect to be within the parameters or not to be within the parameters of the model, and you want to compare that to what you've actually observed. So one is a simulated data set and the other one is your observed values, maybe? Um, this really puzzled me. The hypothesis that a parameter equals zero can directly be tested by fitting the model that includes the parameter in question and examining the corresponding 95% interval. Okay, so let's say that we are trying to determine um, like, you know, um, a control versus a test, um, you know, drug uh, regimen, for example. What if those, to make that determination in your model, you have different parameters that contribute towards that model where you can actually see a difference. So it's not just like, if a person loses weight, but then it's a combination of losing weight and maybe your cholesterol level dropping, for example, two, two coefficients. So when you fit that model, do you test each parameter in questions, a 95% interval, or is it a combination of all that, like the composite? Because it says the parameter in question. So what is that? Whether two, I mean, this is not the same thing as this because here you are. I, I'm really confused about the parameter in question, guys. Sorry, I don't know what that means. Isn't it like the coefficients? Yeah. So then, in a model, you could have multiple coefficients, correct? So mm -hmm. what happens if you have multiple coefficients and you want to see uh, like the ones which are changing or different from the control? Like, let's say I'm looking at BMI and uh, cholesterol in, like, those are my parameters, and I have a 
group that's treated with statin and a group that's not treated with statin. So I have a control group and a treatment group. And my two parameters are uh, the lowering of BMI and, um, and uh, lowering of cholesterol. Like that's, those are the parameters of interest. So do I look for 95% confidence intervals for each one of those and then compare it with the control? Or how does it do it? Does it put them all together and combine like the combination of like as if a you, model? If you think about um, how a linear regression, a multiple regression is um, yeah. presented in R, it has a significant value for each coefficient. For each coefficient, that is a good point. But I've never seen confidence intervals for each one. So like, and they seem to, seems a like confidence interval like it plays a big part in like the normal statistic world. Whereas in, in R, I, I think we tend to focus more like on the P values, but I don't see CIs being used as much. You know what I mean? Like it's at least not in your model output. I think the confidence into the cons there is cons confidence intervals oh. in most regressions, I think. Um, yeah. in, I see. In R. Okay. But, like, okay. We don't, in frequentist statistics, we don't tend to use it as often. Okay. Uh, we tend to focus on the um, uh, distribution difference. We focus less on the um, actual data and more on the parameters and to what extent they are different or not, the calculated parameters, that is. Whereas with Bayesian models, it's more about the how much the distributions overlap. So it's a lot more based on the actual uh, actual data that exists because the data can be updated, which I'm presuming is why if we go back above and look at repeated, well, um, we'd expect there to be a probability uh, of, say, 0 0.25% uh, uh, two five of getting a significant value or, mm. uh, or something like that. I don't know. Right here, mm -hmm. 0 0.25, 0 0.25 and 0 0.25 on the two tails, presumably. Yeah. Wait. I see, yeah. But, okay. Okay, so maybe it's something I haven't like looked at in my output to see that there is a confidence interval, but okay, I see. What happens if there's a lot of an overlap between the confidence interval in your control and your, your, your test? Like, if there's then a lot of overlap, then it won't be significant. It would not be significant in that yeah, case. Yeah. Yeah, so if you remember, um, if, you, if, you, if you go back to the page. Uh, if you go back to page 52. 52, okay. You can see the simulations. And yeah. Whether they capture the true value. Um, well, yeah, that's true. If, if you were saying, well, um, it, the, you, the, the, the cells, there's about 5% of them that don't cross the line or capture the <laughs> true value, or in the yeah. fifth increment, they don't capture the value. The, yeah. the further apart they are, the less, um, the less confident we can be that there exists a uh, similarity between the real world and the score that we've got. So when we're gotcha. comparing, that's just comparing the real value versus the sample that we took. But if we were to then compare two different groups, we'd expect there to be some reasonable amount of difference between two different confidence intervals or enough that they don't overlap too much. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay. And you said that the height, the, the bolded part was the 50% um, interval, right? That's what you said that it was, the 50%. And then the, the entire thing was actually the 95%. Yes. Yeah. And I think we figured out that the 50% CI is actually 0.67 off one standard deviation and then the entire range was actually two standard deviations like the 95 percent mm. that's what it seems to be yeah so that's correct okay i think that's what you you said and i went back and checked that's right 50 percent is 0.67 of one standard deviation 95 percent is two standard deviations so what you're seeing is in the bolder part is uh 50 percent of your values or how many of those are 0.67 um units, uh, so, so 0.67 standard deviations away from your mean. Okay, yeah, okay, I think um, eh, kind of makes sense, I'm not sure, but yeah, type one and type two errors, um, it's, um, yeah, I think type one is, um, mm, what is it? It's mistakenly, um, what is it? 
it's okay. So the type one error is the probability of falsely rejecting a null hypothesis when it is actually true, and a type two error is of not rejecting a null hypothesis when it is actually false. So I have a really great picture of this, which I, I keep forgetting the type one and type two error because I really hate that jargon. But let me share with you, and I just recall now that I had saved this picture. It was from someone on Twitter. And it's absolutely fantastic. Let me just share that with you. And it's probably well worth the five minutes that it's going to take me to find it on my phone. Um, so if you guys want to talk about something else, go ahead. Let Is me that the one ahead. where you, for type one, then you can use the, um, like the line to make a P out of it, right? Well, it's actually even funnier. This is a pregnant, uh, this is a guy oh. who is, uh, it's a guy who is uh, uh, pregnant and uh, you are, I, I, let me pull that up. I, I'm, I'm going to just completely botch it up if I say it, but it really drives home uh, the the fact here, the, the, that point really so well. Like even the ones who are like, you know, really seasoned the statisticians, like they really liked it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good one to have in your, like in your in like mental model. So give me like two seconds. I'm trying to find it. If you want to talk about um I have to say that I have to uh, head out by three because I have a service call with uh, a, a rep from Snowflake. So if you want to carry on, but I am, um, um, let me just share this picture. I should have already done it, but I forgot. Um, it's, uh, it's a really great one. I have so many of these things saved. Um, yeah, I got it. Ah, cool. Okay, so let me put it on. Slack. This can relate to like false positives and false negatives. Like yes, because false yes. negatives are like really rare, aren't they? That's right. So let's share it with me. Okay. Um. Yeah, it's here now. So. Um, let me just go ahead and stop share and share the one with it's and I'll also drop this in chat because it's um, it's so cool. Um, close this and go to um, okay, I'm gonna share now. Share screen. Okay, so this is the one. Type one error, false positive you're pregnant. So this is the case where you uh, mistakenly ask, um, reject the null hypothesis, even though it is true. So the, the obviously the hypothesis is that you're not pregnant and here you, you confirm that you're pregnant. And I always have this picture of this guy sitting on a bed. And so that's like a false positive or a type one error. Um, and really, I find it easier to to mentally think of type one as being false positive, just because it's it comes more naturally to me. And I really hate that jargon, but this kind of helps me think about it. So I have always a mental model of this guy sitting on a bed and someone saying that you are pregnant. So the null hypothesis is something, you've rejected the null hypothesis here, even though it is true. Whereas here you actually have a woman who is like outwardly, like she's showing all signs of pregnancy. And the doctor is saying that you are not pregnant. So that is a false negative because you have actually, um, you have accepted the null hypothesis. Like you have mistakenly accepted the null hypothesis, even though it's false. I don't know if this helps, but I, I find it really immensely helpful. Do you guys like it? Oh yeah, I like it. And I have another one. And I think it's like a, a, la a really lazy trick. Uh, oh. Do you want me to, do you want to share your screen, Mikhail? Or? Yes, I want to. Okay, no problem. Here you go. All right, one moment. I need to share my work of art. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm such an expert in MS Spain. And here I have a Roman numeral one and here the Roman numeral two. Oh. So, so I can make a P out of only this one. And then <laughs> I, like for the two, I can, um, make an N out of it. So P positive one, so positive, and then two, and then I can uh, draw the line and then N negative. So I think 
this makes it uh, easier for me to remember which is which. And then, couple, and then coupled with the uh, yeah, with the Practin uh, CK, it really yeah, it really embeds everything into my head finally. It puts it in your head. Yeah, I know, like you need, especially this is so like, it's kind of, yeah, I, I, I totally get you. Like, this is something where you need some help to actually like, you know, do you have any mental models for this, um, uh, uh, August? Um, honestly, um, I just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think we can agree that statisticians are bad at naming things. Yeah, yeah I, I, totally. I, I hear think you. it's really important. Um, um, actually, my my actual um, screen name, Morbus, is um, uh, is related. Is I was chosen because of the relationship between Comte and um, Augustus Comte and Karl oh, Popper. Oh, I uh, see. And, which is Karl Popper basically won the argument, which is that you have to have falsification. Falsification mm. works better than positive. Uh, positive. Um, so the whole point is about making sure that you're proving that some. You have to go in with a hypothesis of proving something does not exist. Uh, <laughs> proving that so, disproving that it's not. Um, disproving that it's not erroneous, and that's the whole point of it. Where because you can otherwise create loads and loads of po um, false positives, can't you? Because you're going. <laughs> Why the null hypothesis exists, right. apart from the position that the effect does not exist, and that what you and what you're trying to do is to prove that um, the null hypothesis is wrong. And if you can't do that, well, it's a lot stronger than saying something's right just because you're saying two things are linked together. Because otherwise, you get uh, spurious correlations, don't you? And those spurious correlations lead to you to assuming cause and effect. That was, um, yeah, that, that's cool, uh, August. <laughs> Let me go ahead and share my screen again, you guys. Um, okay, so uh, we finished all this. Statistical significance, okay. Uh, Yes, so the null hypothesis or a pre-specified value that would indicate no effect present uh, in the context of hypothesis testing. So if, if something is at least two standard errors, um, if they are at least two standard errors away from zero, then that would be considered statistically significant uh, or otherwise it's not. So at the 95% mark, obviously. So really the 95% that we consider like um, the, the significance level is also corresponding to the confidence, uh, your confidence interval, which is really two standard deviations. So if you think about it, they're really the same thing, right? Your significance level at the 95% mark and your 95% confidence interval, which is also two standard errors from zero, they are, they are the same thing. I, so yeah, that's what I realized after I read this multiple times. So let's say we are flipping a coin 20 times. The conventional null hypothesis is of course the number of times that you get the heads times the number of times that you don't get the heads um, over your N and this would be your uh, standard error. And if it was a fair coin or whatever without any bias, it's not a weighted coin or whatever this, um, you know, you would expect it to roughly happen like 50% of the time, obviously. But actually what it is, is um, this, like your, uh, your empirical, empirical thing is actually lesser than what you found. And your standard error is uh, 0 0.1. Uh, so I'm not sure what that means when your standard error, if you compute your standard error, is that how many times it's away from your mean, which should have been 0.5? Isn't it the error of your estimate? Yeah, so 0.5 is your estimate, right? Because you're expecting it to happen 50% of the time, one way or the other, and you're actually getting 40% of uh, the probability of having heads. So, um, so the standard error is actually 0.1 away from that. So 0.4 is actually 0.1 standard error away from 0.5. Does it make sense? Is that Am I intuiting that correctly? Mm, I thought the estimate is 0 0.4 and then the confidence uh, oh. interval is two times um, either plus 
two times the standard error and then or minus two times the standard error and then which is why below we can get this 0 0.18 and 0 0.61. I see. Well, okay, because I thought this was actually measured as the number of heads that they got. So, um, okay, I thought this was empirical. Okay, gotcha. Is that right? Okay, so. So this is still within that range, like uh, 0.10. Oh, no, sorry. This is outside the range of the 95% confidence interval, right? So this is outside that. So because when you look at the 95% CI, you're, all you're looking at really is your standard error range. So this is falling outside that range of 95%, which means that it is significant. Uh, it's more like... Um, the standard error is used in order to be able to calculate your confidence interval. So you yeah. that's how much you move from the 0.4 probability. So that means yes. that within the realm of probability, um, you would expect to see uh, anywhere between 18 and 61% uh, out of um, 20 25 heads. So that would say, well, there's not really significant difference in anything within that 95% confidence interval. Whereas you might say an unfair side of the coin, is a phrase that they often like to use, uh, might say you get 15%, um, uh, you head to 15% of the time, for instance. And then we might say, well, there's actually something wrong there. But of course, it's only one sample out of thousands. Out of thousands. So this is really saying that you get heads 18 18% to 61% of the time and you actually only got head like heads like 10% of time right um, Here no you got you got heads 0.4% uh, of the time but the error in the measurement means that when you times that by uh, the standard by the standard deviation in the, um, because the, it's a standard error remember and that yeah. means that you, in order to get the, in order to get your move away from, here's my estimate, which is right in the center of my curve. And then, not, not in the curve. If you think about the error bar, where it's kind of like that, then your estimate's right in the middle. So your probability's here. And then you've got, um, you've worked out what your potential standard error is, which is how far your measure is off. Mm -hmm. But you, in order to work out within 95% confidence what that it is, you then times it by the standard deviation on both sides. So that's negative two and plus two. And that's where you get your confidence interval from. Oh. So it's not directly your standard error, which is your confidence interval. It's actually the number of, it's in times the, oh, okay, gotcha, okay. Well, it, it kind of is, but it's more like um, yeah. if you wanted to do 50% confidence interval, you times it by one standard deviation instead. Yeah, so I got 0. it. 0. 0.6. 0. 0.67, yeah. Yeah, if you wanted to capture the middle 50%, but if you want to capture, like, say, one yeah. standard deviation, which is what? Yeah. Some 67? Okay, got it. So this would be your confidence interval. And what is this? The 0. 0.1095, what does that mean? That's just the, that's just the expected standard error from uh, of the measure so by by using the number of um the number of measures um you can, mm. you can have a probability from you can have a total probability of 100 right yes um, correct and so you take the probability uh that you've actually obtained from that yeah and then you're just dividing it by n in order to create uh, and then squaring that in order to create the standard error and then you just times that by whatever number you want in order to create your confidence interval. So just think of it as like, um, you know, when you're trying to calculate something like um, the, a light year, you just plug in the constant. So the standard mm -hmm. error is the value that you'd use in place of a constant if you had a variable rate of speed. Yeah. That probably wasn't very helpful. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you don't, I don't think you need to think about it too much. I, th I think all you need to know is that you can calculate standard error uh, from your, the probability, from your probability um, of your two conditions. And then 
you can then times that by the by two because it's uh, which is two standard deviations in order to get both sides of the confidence interval. Yeah. Okay. Which any statistical test will just spit out on you anyway. The confidence intervals clearly contain p equal to 0.5 within their bounds, obviously, because that's the concluding, leading us to conclude that our results are not statistically significant from the null hypothesis. Well, so. Because it's zero point, um, because the maximum confidence interval is 0 0.61. Well, I don't understand what this one is, though. Why is, what is the point for, though? That's and what the is actual the, test result. That's right. Yeah. So this was the empirical one then. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think this is like a an ex an example of whether a coin is fair or not, right? So you toss um, the coin yeah. uh, twenty times, and then you get yeah. eight heads. Yeah. And then after you flip uh, the coin yourself, then you get. Um, eight out of uh, 20 heads, that makes it 0 0.4. 0 0.4. And because if a coin is really fair or not, then of course you would uh, expect yeah. to get- 10, um, 10 by 20. Yeah. Yes. 0.5. But of course we're only taking 20 measures, so we would expect yes. an error in that. Whereas if we increase the value, we probably yeah. get yeah. Yeah. seeing 0.4. Something closer mm -hmm. to. Uh, our yeah. standard error, our standard yeah. error would be smaller. Therefore, yeah. confidence yeah. would be smaller. Correct. That's correct. I, yeah. And I think well, this formula really shows that if you have um, a bigger n, then the standard error will be smaller, and then your confidence interval will be more narrow. So it makes it um, easier to find difference between 0.4 and 0.5. Very good point. That's correct. If you had a larger n, so even though you got 0 0.5, 0 0.4. 0.4 is actually within this range. So you would actually conclude that it's a fair coin, even if you got 0.4, though you would expect to see 0.5. However, if you increase the size of N, then chances are that this would be like not enclosed by your C confidence interval. And so then you would say that, okay, hey, you know, 0.5 is what we want, but we got 0.4. And since we did it so many number of times, our C confidence interval is smaller. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, Mikhail. Did we, did, uh, well, uh, August, would you agree with what we both just said? Almost, um, just to distinguish a little bit, it's not that it contains 0.4, it's that your confidence interval contains 0.5, which is the null hypothesis, but there's no yeah. difference. Oh yeah, 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 okay, that's right. So what we observed was 0.4, but the null hypothesis is that there's no difference. Yeah, and that's within the confidence interval. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So guys, I'm really sorry. I have a call now at three o'clock. So I'm going to get on that. It's a web share with a vendor. So um, do you mind if I jump off and you guys can continue? I apologize for this, but I think we pretty much got through the material of the second part. And I think we, I was really, I really thought that this discussion was very valuable to me because I learned a lot right here, just right here. Yeah, no worries. Um, All right. Yes, actually, there's still a lot of material for this chapter, Maybe, but you have done two sessions, and I think I can do um, the rest of this chapter. Oh, you yeah, think there's more that needs to be covered? Um, yeah, it's still um, quite a bit, I would say. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, unless I put some skin in the game, then I don't want, uh, yeah. And yeah. I, I learn more if I... Uh, put a commitment. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to leave now, but thank you yeah. so much. And I'll uh, see you guys on Slack. Bye guys. Thanks a lot. All right. See you next Bye. week. Yeah.